The American Revolutionary War deep dive continues today. We've been getting one perspective on things via the musical Hamilton and another set of facts from Oversimplified and the American Revolution Oversimplified. Today is the American Revolution Oversimplified Part 2. Welcome back, friends, and a special welcome. Welcome to all the new friends out there. I'm Yo BGS. Getting caught up on history, I feel like I'm getting pretty close to not being a history noob anymore. But when it comes to the second half of the American Revolution, I know there's something that I could at least brush up on, and that's why we're checking out Oversimplified today. If you like these videos, by the way, make sure to check and see if you are subscribed. I've got a lot of cool things planned for 100k subs, including I'm going to tell everyone the radio stations I work at, which, among other things, will let you know my uh, real name. So, you know, we got a ways to go, but that'll be fun. I was not expecting this. I did not expect George to literally be bent over to start this video, but that's what we got, and here we go. Washington's butt was sufficiently kicked. Winter was- And that was the end of the war. No. It's here. His troops' morale was low. Some just up and left. Washington needed to do something, anything to restore faith in the revolution. The British had spread throughout New Jersey and settled in for a winter of drinking cider and partying hard. Nobody expected an attack in the winter, so Washington started making plans for an attack in the winter. The you know, you, you realize this a lot with conventional warfare, by the way. This idea that when winter sets in, it can greatly turn the tide of battle. And it's interesting because, well, I guess England would have some particularly cold uh, and precipitous days. Because I'm like, why would the British be so much better suited to fight in the cold than the American troops were? Not to mention, the British troops were kind of rolling in style relatively, and the American troops were kind of just doing whatever they could to get by. British had hired a large force of Hessian mercenaries from the German states of Hesse Castle and Hesse Hanau to fight the rebels. It was these mercenaries that were stationed across the Delaware River from Washington and his army. And there were more Hessian reinforcements incoming, but they made an unscheduled stop because their commander got thirsty. No, not that kind of thirsty. That kind of thirsty. As long as there have been guys, there have been battles that have been lost to... Thirsty. No, not that kind of thirsty. That kind of thirsty. It was Christmas mm -hmm. Eve with a blizzard outside when Washington heard the Hessian defenses were down and he decided to attack. He made a perilous crossing of the icy Delaware River with 2,400 men and marched nine miles to Trenton where he caught the Hessian forces completely off guard. I always laugh when I hear about Washington crossing the Delaware because there's a radio show I listen to where the guys are even more history noobs than I am. And they were arguing one day and someone said, Washington crossed the Delaware, there's pictures of it. There's a painting of it, but come on. Fierce battle, the Hessians surrendered in droves. It was a much needed victory that sent a clear message, not only to the British, but See? to Americans across there's pictures the colonies. Of it. The war was far from lost. General Cornwallis led the British forces south to counterattack the Americans, but in a series of battles, Washington's defensive positioning and flanking was it but really in a series of battle the Battle of Assin Pink Creek? Washington's defensive positioning and flanking maneuvers defeated the British three times in ten days, and the British decided to abandon southern New Jersey for the rest of the winter. Washington finally set up a winter camp in Morristown, but for the Americans, there was much less partying than the British. Elsewhere What else was going on at this point? Like, uh, leave me a comment down below, because we're hearing a lot about, obviously, the fighting in some critical areas of, you know, the colonies at this point up in New England, but I I would be inclined to believe that this battle was going on all down sort of the eastern seaboard, right? Anywhere that the British could get a foothold was probably where they were going. You know, especially if you were worried about, like, the American colonies getting support from Spain, the, the Spaniards in Florida and stuff like that. But it's really interesting that this is primarily where things have focused. Where the British had taken Newport, Rhode Island, because it was a good naval base. In the South, they failed to take Charleston, South Carolina, which- I guess I should just watch another 10 seconds because then I would know. Left British loyalists unsupported and vulnerable to more harassment and even mass expulsion. Congress sent Benjamin Franklin to France on a mission to convince them to join the war. And while the French generally loved any opportunity to hoodwink the Brits, they didn't want to join unless it was a sure win. So for now, Franklin spent his days chilling out and chasing tail. The British. You know, it's hard to believe that this is a body type that would have you know, been been able to, to get some things done <laughs> at any point in history. The government couldn't believe the war wasn't over yet, and the pressure was on to end it. So the British came up with a plan. 
General Burgoyne in Montreal and General William Howe in New York would advance through the Hudson Valley and meet in the middle, splitting the colonies in two and thus screwing over the American communication lines. Burgoyne began his movement south, and after taking Fort Ticonderoga quite easily, he then came across heavy American resistance, so he sent Howe a dingle dongle asking if he'd be showing up anytime soon. Meanwhile, Howe had completely abandoned the- Did he just say a dingle dongle? I'm pretty sure he did. My volume got a little bit low here, sorry. If he'd be showing- Lil Bow How? <laughs> The American resistance, so he sent Howe a dingle dongle asking if he'd be showing up anytime soon. Meanwhile, Howe had completely abandoned the plan and gone for all out personal glory by capturing the American capital, Philadelphia. He defeated Washington and his army at Brandywine Creek by using the old hit him with a decoy and flank him from behind tactic, and Philadelphia was now in British hands, forcing Congress to escape to York. But Burgoyne was left on his own to face the ever increasing American force in Saratoga. American General Horatio Gates teamed up with our old friend Benedict Arnold to deal one final blow to Burgoyne's army. He returns! Oh, he's got an apple, by the- oh, and an, an apple and an orange. It's interesting to, to question, you know, how history would be different if different leaders had behaved differently. Like, if Howe had gone north, what would the implications of that have been? Because splitting up the colonies seems like a pretty damn good plan. Although, Howe also succeeded in capturing Philadelphia, so it's hard to argue that his plan, his plan worked, but did it serve the greater, you know, military uh, operation, right? That's, that's one of the things that, as we've learned about all the different wars and stuff, has been really fascinating to me, is if people had done things differently, and obviously it's impossible to tell how it would have shaken out, but... You'd have to think it would have changed things somewhat. Arnold wanted to take the fight to the British, but Gates wanted to wait for the British to come to them. After a heated debate, Gates, the senior officer, told Arnold to go to his room. But Arnold defied his orders, and at the Battle of Bemis Heights, he charged at the British and obliterated them. Great job, wow. Horatio. By the way, what happened to that other guy who was in Saratoga? Who? Benedict Arnold. Never heard of him. Ouch. Wow. Hey, George. Didn't I do a great job? Taking Philadelphia and all? Hmm? Didn't I? You're fired. Both Burgoyne and Howe returned to Great Britain, leaving British General Henry Clinton to take charge of the war. And the war was about to take a nasty turn, because with the victory at Saratoga, the French were finally ready to join the Americans. All right, Benny, we're in. Hey, isn't this kind of funny? You know, because you're a republic trying to overthrow an absolute monarchy, and I'm an absolute monarchy helping you? Like, like, could you imagine if your revolution inspired my people to revolt against me, and then they imprisoned me and all my family, and they chopped all of our heads off? Could you imagine? But like, oh, hindsight is always twenty twenty, friends. Hindsight is always twenty twenty. That's called foreshadowing. <laughs> Coming twenty twenty seven. Hey, we're almost there. For now, in America, winter was here once again, which meant yet more disease, more starvation, and even a little mutiny. After losing Philadelphia, Washington's job was again on the line. But suddenly, a Prussian guy with a very fancy name, hard Friedrich Wilhelm August Heinrich Ferdinand Steuben. That is indeed a fancy name. Also, I still cannot get over how in every in every shot, Washington just looks like he's doing the cover of his own emo album. He just, like, because look, the way his eyes are situated, he's not making eye contact. He's just looking off into the distance. By Benjamin Franklin showed up out of nowhere and said, hey, I'm here to give your man a European military training. And train them he did. They learned how to shoot accurately, how to march in formation, where to poop and where not to. And strict punishments were handed out to anyone that didn't comply. What? <laughs> he actually beat the poop out of him. I was not, I was prepared. You know, war prepares you for a lot of things. That wasn't one of them. Washington's army came out of the winter in 1778, a new and improved force, ready to take Philadelphia back from the British. In the end, though, they didn't have to. With the French entry into the war, the British ordered General Clinton to evacuate Philadelphia and consolidate all of the British forces in New York. So Washington sent Benedict Arnold to reoccupy and secure the city as he pursued the British through New Jersey on land, eventually finding a good opportunity to attack at Monmouth Courthouse. The battle took place on a sweltering hot summer's day, and as many soldiers died- Oh, that's a cool effect, too! If you look, they did the little, uh, um, I don't know what to call it other than like a heat index thing, but the little wavy lines you can see rippling up through the troops. Placed on a sweltering hot summer's day, and as many soldiers died I love from that. heat stroke as they did from battle. In the end, after some incompetence slash borderline treason from Washington's second in command, it was a draw. And in this war, a draw is kind of a victory for the Americans. Next up.
Let's talk about this guy. This is John Paul Jones. John Paul Jones is handsome, Scottish, and absolutely insane. When the war ah! first broke out, everyone was like, how did the colonies expect to stand up to the might of the British Navy with their meager fleet of converted merchantmen? Yep, try telling that to John Paul Jones. This guy sailed to the British Isles, somehow captured a British ship off the coast of Ireland, and brought it back to France. Then he returned, attacking more ships, raiding towns, and evading capture the entire time. What? These are basically pirate tactics. But hey, if it works, it works. In one incident, he captured a British ship and returned to a Dutch port without an official ensign because his was lost during the battle. That's a big no-no and can have you arrested as a pirate. The Dutch helped him out by quickly creating a design based on Benjamin Franklin's description of what the American flag should look like. <laughs> it's so close. Like, th this is a perfect example of the way that the game telephone works. Remember when like, when you were little and you'd... you'd tell someone something and then by the end of it it's just a completely distorted mess i almost like this more this is really it's really no it's really cool no it's it's, it's spot on 10 out of 10. We can have you arrested as a pirate. The Dutch helped him out by quickly creating a design based on Benjamin Franklin's description of what the American flag should look like, and they entered it into their records as an official U.S. flag. What they came up with looks pretty cool. The whole campaign probably... That's what I said. It's just interesting how the, like, the, the, like, the blue box, and then there's blue stripes down here. Did they get three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten? They got 13... These aren't in a, well, I guess they're technically rounded, but... What they came up with looks pretty cool. The whole campaign probably played heavily on British morale and brought into question their ability to win the war. And fun fact, he was so cool that one of the towns he raided in 1778 gave him an official honorary pardon in 1999. Keep ripping in heaven, John Paul Jones. You're an angel now. In 1999, they pardoned him. What the Continental Navy was lacking in resources though, the French entry into the war made up for. The French began with naval skirmishes in the English Channel, and they sent a large fleet to America, although it sustained a lot of damage in a storm off Rhode Island. The First of all, question, why with naval is this a mistake in the that the French flag is... No, okay, I see it now. I had to look really close because it looks like it's just a whited out box, and I'm like, was that a placeholder that never got replaced by the actual flag? And this is really cool because this is something that in u.s history classes we don't really learn about like we knew that the french helped but it was almost like you know british ships and french ships were sailing to america almost side by side getting ready to gear up for the war they don't really mention the conflicts that were happening back here English Channel, and they sent a large fleet to America, although it sustained a lot of damage in a storm off Rhode Island. The Americans were hoping for a bigger commitment from the French, so John Adams went to France to help Benjamin Franklin continue negotiations. Oh good, you're finally here. Check this out. Hey ladies, I'd like to fly you like a kite, cause you're electrifying. <laughs> Isn't this great? Is this? Is this what you've been doing? Yeah. Why? We were sent here on a diplomatic mission to secure military support from France, not to philander with the locals. Wait, no ladies, come back. <sighs> Worst wingman ever. <laughs> I love that he's like ye old comic book guy. Even in, you know, this is probably what comic book guy would look like if he if he had a real portrait. But the Americans would get some more help. The Dutch provided aid, although they never formed an official alliance. More significantly, though, the Spanish, who had already been providing aid, officially joined the war in June 1779. They would provide support in the Midwest and the Gulf Dang. Coast. Campaigns that heavily impacted the Native American. That's a lot of support. Tribes in those areas. Both sides actually enlisted the help of Native American tribes throughout the war. Sometimes even pitting those tribes against each other. In the summer of 1779. But wasn't that just sort of a proxy war for the tribes that were already at war? I feel like in in some instances anyway those tribes were at, at odds with each other and they just sort of used this as a way to to get there. After a series of raids against the Americans by the Iroquois, Washington organized an expedition that burned down more than 40 villages, forcing the tribes to relocate to Canada for British protection. And another group that shouldn't go unmentioned were African Americans, both free and enslaved. They joined both sides of the war, hoping to gain their freedom, but afterwards many were simply returned to slavery, particularly those who had fought for the Americans. Despite owning slaves himself, Jefferson had written a condemnation of slavery in the Declaration of Independence, but out of fear of offending the Southern colonies, this was removed from the final draft. For the same reason, the American army stopped enlisting African-American men in 1775, a policy that Washington, a slave owner himself, supported. But they were forced to reverse the policy after the British promised freedom to any slaves who joined them. In general, you stood a better chance of gaining freedom 
if you fought for the British. However, even those that left with the British after the war suffered mistreatment and discrimination in their new lives outside of America. Our good friend Benedict Arnold is now in charge of- Ugh, and that whole- That whole segment is something that, as I was sitting here listening, you know, I was trying to think of something to say, but it's so clearly beyond- me to even postulate, you know, anything funny or profound to say there. Cause I was even sitting there. I'm like, well, what do you do in that instance? And then I'm like, uh, try and get to a Spanish, you know, the Spanish occupied territory. And then you realize that if this is South Carolina and this is Georgia, you're basically running through all of Mississippi, Alabama, parts of Louisiana. And to, to suggest like, Oh, just do that. Again, it's easy when it's a spot on a map that's completely shaded in. It's another thing entirely when you're contemplating doing Outside it. Outside of America. Our good friend Benedict Arnold is now in charge of Philadelphia. Having a good time, parting down with, and even marrying a member of the... Okay, this may... Philadelphia. Having a... This may replace my happy face and oversimplified's best things. This just... <laughs> Cutting loose, Ben. Our good friend Benedict Arnold is now in charge of Philadelphia. It's also cracked how, like, good and useful... Benedict Arnold was right until he wasn't you know what I'm saying like so far so good I keep expecting every time he comes up to be like this is where he completely you know drops the ball but yeah. having a good time ah, parting down with that's even fine a member of the Philadelphia elite the same elite that had partied down with the British when that they not so the much city. and suddenly the people of Philadelphia including the state governor started accusing Arnold of having pro-British sentiments to keep the people happy, Washington wrote a letter rebuking Arnold, calling his conduct imprudent and improper, and that was too many ouchies for Benedict Arnold to handle. He asked Washington to put him in charge of the fort at West Point. Then he contacted the British, offering to hand the plans of the fort over to them and join their side. Our good friend Benedict Arnold is our good friend no more. Luckily, the treasonous plans were discovered on a captured British officer, but- How crazy is it that Benedict Arnold was a Benedict Arnold? Like, that's- you talk about one of the greatest moments of convenience in all world history. If his name had been Jameson Janderschmance, it probably, I don't know, would, you, would they still call him a Benedict Arnold? Arnold managed to escape before he was arrested. As a British Brigadier General, he would go on to lead raids against American cities, most notably his raid of Richmond, Virginia in 1781. His betrayal shook George Washington, who had once again set up camp at Morristown. His leadership somehow held the Continental Army together through the harshest winter of the war. <laughs> The, is is the eating shoes is that a running joke throughout all of oversimplified i've n i notice this all the time we're entering 1780 and parliament was hopping mad that the war still wasn't over the british debt was soaring and despite taking parts of massachusetts in late 1779 the north was in a stalemate so the british decided to make a major shift in strategy <laughs> and you cannot new year new me benedict arnold my silence is just another word for pain Good lord. He decided to make a major shift in strategy to the south, an economically rich area with a higher level of support for the British, or so the British thought. A year earlier, they had captured the underdefended city of Savannah, Georgia easily, and a joint American-French counter siege failed. Now, they laid siege to Charleston, South Carolina. It fell within months, with thousands of American troops surrendering to the British, a costly defeat. The British quickly moved to take control, and they sent stereotypical Hollywood villain with a British accent, Bannister the Butcher Tarleton, into the backcountry, yeah, where he hunted down rebels fair. and destroyed them with ruthless brutality. The British presence also inspired local loyalist militias in the backcountry to rise up against their persecutors. The British really seemed to be onto something with their new strategy, and the ball was very much in Washington's court. I'm gonna send my most loyal general, Nathaniel Green, to the south to stop the British. Gonna have to overrule you there, George. We're sending Hero of Saratoga and your biggest rival, Horatio Gates. Watch this, George. I'm gonna save the day again. Everybody will love me, and I'm gonna get your job. I thought Lee was Washington's biggest rival. You're starting to learn that Washington had quite a few rivals. Here I go. And he got into one battle with Cornwallis, got annihilated, and ran away. Alrighty, let's go with your guy. Nathaniel Green knew the British outnumbered his own forces and wouldn't be defeated with conventional tactics, so he had to think outside the box. He split his arm- Oh, I thought he was gonna go like- I thought that was a solid snake strat where you use a bot, put a box over your head and use that as camouflage. Two said, hey big boy, look at me. And then they went running in two different directions. Cornwallis sent Tarleton after Morgan and he caught up with him at Cowpens, where Morgan proceeded to kick Tarleton's butt. Then the two led Cornwallis on a wild chase through North Carolina. His bigger and better equipped army much heavier and slower than Green's quick and mobile troops. I don't 
don't know, man. I want to be in the crew that's got the yum yum lots of rum. Equipped army much heavier and slower than Green's quick and mobile troops. Green led Cornwallis further and further from his supply line, then crossed the Dan River into Virginia, picked up some reinforcements, and turned back to face the now exhausted British. At the Battle of Guilford Courthouse, the two sides engaged in vicious close combat. Cornwallis, fearing loss, fired his big guns into the chaotic fighting, cutting down many of his own men. Green retreated, giving Cornwallis the victory, but Cornwallis lost a quarter of his men in the fighting, so it felt much more like a British defeat. At this point, both sides desperately needed something to happen soon to end the fighting. The British were running out of money, while the Americans were happen soon to end the fighting. The British were running How many times is he going to cut to this shot? Don't forget to like and subscribe. Hey, look, you you learn this in journalism school. If you have a good shot, don't be afraid to to go back to it when you need it. That's there's nothing wrong with that. Out of money, while the Americans were again facing mutinies as the men went without pay or even basic living needs. Fortunately, the French were now showing up in greater numbers and were ready to fight. After his encounter with Green, Cornwallis decided the only way to win the South was to first prevent the Southern Continental Army from using Virginia as a supply base. So he abandoned the Carolinas, moving to Wilmington and onto Yorktown, a position the British believed would be easy to supply and support. On his march to Yorktown, he raided many farms, stealing horses and supplies from the locals, but also freeing that. You know, you knew we were going to see that one again. And again, mentally, I was just thinking about that 550 troops was a quarter of his men. Because, you know, we came from like World War II where you would hear about battalions and groups in these sieges of hundreds of thousands of people. And then you realize, again, 2,200 men to occupy and advance through multiple states at that point stealing horses and supplies from the locals but also freeing thousands of slaves many of whom joined him the french saw cornwallis's new position as an opportunity to land a decisive blow on the british washington wanted to attack clinton in new york but the french said it was a really dumb idea and to be fair it was instead washington sent out fake dispatches to make it look like they would attack clinton but secretly <laughs> their combined force marched all the way down to virginia a large french fleet under the command of comte de grasse arrived and successfully cleared the british navy out of the chesapeake bay the combined land and naval forces then laid siege to Cornwallis's army in Yorktown. The American and French forces tightened in around the city, raining artillery. Man, that is a... See, now I want to look up... See, I'm always like a stats nerd, and like a math nerd. I'm like, what was the biggest battle of the war? Because this... If, if we assume that these are all to scale, right? And every flag represents X number of units, and every ship represents a certain number of, you know, water units... Navy, naval forces, I don't know why I couldn't think of that. This is gigantic. Down on Cornwallis, who desperately appealed to Clinton for aid, but Clinton was unusually chilled out about the whole thing. Cornwallis held out for nearly a month before he Odd. had no choice but to surrender. Over 7,000 British troops were captured, a crushing defeat. And with that, Parliament had reached the end of its rope. The war just wasn't worth it, and it needed to end now. The British still held New York, Charleston, and Savannah, but fighting between the two sides mostly ceased as peace negotiations opened up in Paris. The resulting treaty in 1783 saw Great Britain remove its troops from American soil, recognize U.S. independence, and cede territory up to the Mississippi River. In return, the Americans agreed wow. to pay any debt still owed to Britain and gave fair treatment to any colony territory up to the Mississippi River. In yeah, that's a sweeping victory. Turn the Americans agreed to pay any debt still owed to Britain and gave fair treatment to any colonists who had remained loyal to the crown. The Spanish got Florida, while the French got an economic crisis that led to its own revolution a decade later. Washington re You know, sometimes you got to look out for yourselves and it seems like that was not the case where where France was concerned. But it's interesting too. You know, America agreed to pay their debts. That was almost what this whole thing started over, except it obviously, you know, Britain wanted an ongoing stream of revenue, but still they ended up getting the money. Hired to his home in Mount Vernon, wishing his men farewell by saying, I most devoutly wish that your latter days may be as prosperous and happy as your former ones have been glorious and honorable. He hoped to live out the rest of his days in peace. But unfortunately for him, a number of people <laughs> wanted him to be the first leader of the new country. And by a number of people, I mean literally everyone. The first election campaign in American history was basically a grassroots effort to convince Washington to accept the office. He was sworn in on April 30th, 1789, and he himself established many of the standards and limitations of what the American American leader should be. Imagine that, by the way, right? The all of the fighting that we have in 2022 over the presidency, the people were so united back then that it wasn't two people campaigning against each other, it was the country 
campaigning to get this dude to sign First up. All, there was debate on what he should be called. Is he a king? Is he a glorious leader? In the end, they went for a word that at the time was pretty modest. President, like the president of your local bowling club or office bake sale committee. He set up a cabinet of expert advisors knowing that no president could know everything, no matter how much of a stable genius they claimed to be. He proposed major legislation to Congress. Oh my goodness. And I don't know if Oversimplified's ever done a face reveal, but that would have been the perfect time to cut to oversimplified just sipping tea. He gave an annual State of the Union address to keep his own power in check. He stated that the U.S. should remain neutral in foreign conflicts, and in the end, he voluntarily gave up his power after just two terms. He could have made the presidency anything he wanted, but his careful and cautious actions helped set the precedent of an office that is powerful in its limitations, decisive through its diplomacy, and respected in its humility. And so the United States was born, and everything was perfect. It had no problems, not a single one. Certainly nothing that would, I don't know, cause such an extreme divide that it would lead to a civil war. Wait a minute, this is that foreshadowing thing again. Plus, plus they still have colossal amounts of bills. And this was a time when countries would just sort of invade and take things. So protecting the new country is very, I, I would say very difficult. Anyway, moving on. Quick oh. quiz, name the most American thing you can think of, baseball? Bold Eagles? No, the most American thing I can think of is like if um if a Starbucks at Walmart um sold um hot dogs and McDonald's French fries, right? Um okay, wait, no, 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 no. The most okay, the most American thing I can think of is if you could get a funnel cake um at Goodwill. No, the most hang on, the most American thing. I can think of is breaking into someone's house, breaking your leg while robbing them, suing them because their floorboards weren't well put together, winning the lawsuit, but then having to spend all of your money to pay for your health care. That is the most American thing I can Calling think of. Calling the winner of an America only sports tournament world champions? Or maybe math and science? Wait, math and science? That's right. If you didn't know, science is as American as combining chicken with waffles. And don't just take my word for it, ask Thomas Jefferson. Of course, to do that, you would need a time machine. And that would take some math and a lot of science. Interesting. If you want to deeply understand math and science. Oh, so you want to the this the was universe. the, this was the, see, I thought we were still going with the video. This was the cautious segue into the uh, brilliant ad here. Well, there you go. Brilliant. Sign up for free. Apparently, I'm guessing that he's gotten way more than 200 subs at this point. Uh, over to over to that organization. I want to see if there's anything else here at the end. Oh, you gotta love that there. Nope, nothing else there. So we'll go back to we'll go back to this nice little. There we go. Picture of picture of happiness. The colonies, as it were. And it's kind of cool. I lived in South Carolina for a little while. Um, and I've been to Fort Moultrie a few times. It was a fort that was built using palmetto logs and they said that it helped in times of the revolutionary war because the cannonballs would bounce off of the 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 palm logs essentially and it was something that helped it. now i don't know if that's true or if that's just one of those things that we learned growing up this inlet here kind of looks like a butt uh but on that note uh that is gonna do it for me for this video um i hope you enjoyed let me know in the comments if you want me to check out more oversimplified or anything else like that Always up for some new ideas. Um, subscribe if you had a good time. Take care, and I will see you apparently in the next conflict.